The following interview was conducted with Gene Cernan, Captain U.S. Navy, retired Purdue class of 1956 and former astronaut for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Saturday, March 5, 2011 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Gene Cernan. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years. Well, golly, that's a long time ago. Uh, next week it'll be 77 years, as a matter of fact. I was born in Chicago, <clears throat> in in uh, St. Anthony's Hospital in Chicago. Uh, <clears throat> we never lived in a city. We lived in the suburbs, which at one time was called a Sticks, an area called Maywood, Bellwood. <clears throat> Excuse me, Elmhurst, that area. And I was just a typical young kid, blue-collar family, uh, growing up. Uh, do you have any brothers Born in and 1934, saw so as a Depression baby and okay. grew up during uh, World War II. Uh, a lot happened after that I never would have imagined, obviously. That's right. Tell us a little about high school. Where, 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 well, I, uh, I went to a, a big high school, Proviso High School, in the suburban part of Illinois. We had, golly, I think 4,000 kids at that time. Of course, since then it's got bigger. It's split into two high schools, like so many other things. Uh, um, mom and dad both both worked. I remember my, uh, and I had one sister, by the way, an older sister. <clears throat> She's about four and a half years older than I am. Went to the same high school, and then she eventually became a uh, a teacher. Went to what at that time was Northern Illinois State Teachers College. Uh, and I was just, I suppose, a typical kid in grammar school and high school. Played all the Sports, athletics, and sports played a big part in my life, particularly the big three, baseball, football, basketball. I was, uh, you know, I made my varsity letter, played first team on all of, all of those, uh, but I never was, uh, I never was good enough to play big time at Purdue. Not big enough, nor was I good enough. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I was a good student in school. Uh, I guess I didn't have to work too hard at it. Don't ask me why. <clears throat> my dad, uh, <clears throat> my dad never um, never had an opportunity to go to college. Going back a little bit, um, mom and dad were second generation. Uh, mom's folks immigrated around the turn of the century uh, from Bohemia in what is now the Czech Republic, and uh, dad's folks uh, immigrated about the same time from Slovakia, uh, and they obviously came to Chicago at some point in time. And uh, I never really knew my mother's parents because my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, died before I was born, and my paternal, uh, maternal grandfather died when I was about a year old, so I never really knew them at all. My dad's mother and father uh, eventually had a dairy farm in north central Wisconsin. Uh, they lived there the way they did in, quote, the old country. Everything from the outhouse to the kerosene lamps, milking cows by hand. Kids don't understand that today. Uh, no electricity, no telephone, uh, you know, no tractors, no hay loaders, mm -hmm. just horses and plows. And I think part of my growing up education uh, I got from my granddad and my dad both, obviously, because I spent almost every summer up there. <clears throat> until I got in high school from the time I was a year old on that farm. I mean, I was pitching hay and, and, and picking potatoes and, as I say, whatever, you know. Needed to be done. Whatever needed to be done, and we did it, quote, the old-fashioned way. And wintertime, Dad and I would go up there on, uh, <clears throat> on weekends, and I can remember sometimes my granddad would have to take steps from the from the house into the snow, and we'd walk across the snow down into the barn. Nice place to be in the wintertime because all the cows were were all uh, uh, stacked in there, and it was warm. Sure. The cows and the horses all stayed in the wintertime because in, inside, because it's just too doggone cold. Uh, but my granddad was a was a fascinating uh, man. He was about four and a half feet tall but could work like a giant. And uh, I think without knowing it, I learned a great deal of my values uh, 
from him, and in turn, obviously, along the way from my dad. Anyway, uh, um, as I said earlier, Mom, uh, we bought a, a car, a 1941 Chevrolet, just before the war started, which was about the last of the cars that were made until after the war. And I remember Mom went to work to help pay for the car, and certain things stick in your mind. Right. You know, dates you went to the moon, and, and, and I happen to remember that car, special deluxe Chevrolet, cost us $800, and uh, Mom had to go to work to help pay for it and work for the next 30 years. What sort of work did she do? Well, she... Worked in an office or...? No, oh. she wound coils with her bare hands. She worked in a little, Fact in a little factory? factory, and her hands, she would thread coils for transformers. You know, Mom never went to college either, so... And, and Dad, uh, Dad uh, ended up being, Dad could do anything. He could build a garage, he could fix a toilet, he could rewire your house. He, had, he could have been, I think, any, any kind of an engineer he wanted to had he had the opportunity to go to school. Sure. The opportunity just didn't exist for him. And so we were a working blue-collar family, and as I say, I was a typical kid in, in high school. Uh, my first car was a car that my granddad on Wisconsin, a Model A <laughs> Ford Coupe. My granddad had, I think, I think he and Grandma drove it up to Wisconsin when I went up there probably in the, in the 30s. He put it on blocks, never drove it again. And uh, it was that was my- condition. <laughs> it was great. Away, of course, the tires were rotted and everything, but Dad and I put new tires, and, um, and when I was about 16, years old, I think we drove that car home. That was my, that was my car in college. But anyway, I ended up getting pretty good grades. Uh, uh, I, I, did they mean something to me then? Yes, but probably meant more later. I, I think I graduated an upper 2% out of a class of 900. Uh, and uh, my dream as a kid, and this is a really important part of my life, being a sort of a product of World War II, I would watch everything that was going on. Television, going to be hard for, for kids in the future who review this oral history to realize there was a time when there was no television, much less no iPhones, <laughs> the kind of things we take for granted today. Yeah. Well, we really didn't have television. Finally, somewhere in the late 40s, black and white television came around. But uh, Dad was... Too old for war, too young for World War One, and too old for World War Two. So we'd go to a, a movie on weekends and see the movie tone, black and white news. What was going on in the world? You know what was going on in Europe and France and Germany, and what was going on in the Pacific. And somewhere along the way, when I saw those unsung, unknown heroes at the time, who have since become icons of aviation history, right. uh, fly airplanes, make airplanes, machines do things they weren't built to do in World War II in the Pacific, I wanted to fly. I wanted to fly airplanes off of aircraft carriers. As a kid, that was my dream. Good. Unbeknown to me at the time, my dad had a dream. And his dream for, was for me to get the education he never had an opportunity to get. And those dreams were not, they, they didn't counter each other, but when the time came to go to college, it was a natural thing, you know, I was going to go to college. I mean, that was in my mind, and of course, my dad would have had it no other way. And he wanted me to get the best engineering education I could get. And uh, I had applied for and got a Naval ROTC scholarship. And Dad said, I want you to go to Purdue, and you're going to study engineering. And I thought engineers drove locomotives at that time. I didn't pay much attention to it. And, uh, but when I applied for the Naval ROTC here at Purdue, the, the, the quota was filled. There was no room. And so... They said, You're, you can have your second choice was University of Illinois. There was a lot of scholarship money involved. And my dad said, no way. 
And let me tell you, mom and dad had to work to put my sister and I through college. And he said, no way, you're not going to Illinois, you're going to Purdue. Well, I could get a lesser scholarship, Naval ROTC, but lesser, much, much lesser. Uh, but dad wanted me to go to Purdue, so I was still able to get a Naval ROTC at Purdue. And, uh, and you know, and still head towards naval aviation and towards a degree. And I think the real key is uh, four years later, uh, I, uh, I graduated in June of 1956 uh, with a diploma in one hand and, and orders the Naval Aviation Flight Training in Pensacola in the other hand. My dad's dream was fulfilled and my dream was being fulfilled and they came together and I cannot tell you how insignificant and important that education was because Everything I did in life, although I never really, quote, practiced as an engineer, I used that education. I used the logic. I used the learning process. I used everything that it took to get that degree in engineering here at Purdue with everything else I did. Oh, flying I airplanes. I, I mean, flying airplanes, putting a logic from an administrative point of view to the technical point of view. It And, and I tell my grandkids, I tell kids everywhere I see them, <clears throat> it's not so much what you learn in college, it's that you learn how to learn, because you're going to be learning the rest of your life, and a place to learn how to learn is at Purdue, and I don't think, nothing against any other, uh, any other uh, choices of, of, of endeavor or study, but engineering is, it gives you by far the greatest capability to go anywhere you want to go. Once you've got that foundation, once you learn how to learn in that environment, I don't think there's anything you can't do. Mm -hmm. So Purdue played, the, the two things that have played historically and personally the biggest part of my life and have sort of gone hand in hand. And even today I'm doing some things that tie Naval Aviation and Purdue together, but our Purdue and naval aviation. You know, they've been my life, both of them have been my life, all my life, and little did I know at the time, and I don't want to sound uh, over nostalgic about it, but uh, unbeknown to me, I, I took my first steps to the moon right here in West Lafayette. And 1956, Sputnik hadn't even flown. I mean, space, Space flight didn't exist. If I would have told somebody I was going to go to the moon, they would have put me in a straitjacket. You talk about my dream. I, I have five-year, I've always had five-year goals. And my, I have I've committed to five years in the Navy. And boy, I was going to fly off aircraft carriers. That's where I was headed. And you never know when opportunities are going to come by. And uh, you're going to have to make some decisions in your life. And, Fortunately, I ended up uh, making the right one. It's uh, the the um, thinking back to those days. Uh, it it ended up to be almost ten years to the day because in, I graduated in June '56, and in June '66, I was circling this world in space on my first space flight. I was a second. American ever to get out of a spacecraft. I was walking around the world in space 10 years after, getting out. after I graduated. And you know, when you're at that age, 10 years is a lifetime. When you're where I am today and you look back, 10 years is about that long. Right. I, I just, I just, I just, I don't know. I'm, and what happened to me after that, and I got to consider myself the luckiest human being in the world, but it, it, I've got to give the majority of that credit to Purdue because that's that's where it all started. And you know, we all have heroes in the world. And sometimes we don't realize until it's too late who our real heroes are. And I think back as to why I did what I did and the opportunities I had. And quite frankly, you know, my dad was my real hero. He's a guy who pointed me in the right direction and, and uh, 
saw to it. I'll tell you something else, though. Graduated from Purdue, or from, from high school. You know, math, sciences were all relatively easy for me. I got to Purdue, and I realized, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> Maybe you're not as smart as you think you are, because you really have to find out who you are, and you really have to buckle down. You know, I, it's a different, it's a transition. I, the, the, right? the, the, the difficulty, and right. you know, if you slack off, I, I'd, I'd, I'd never gotten a, 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 a C, maybe a B or two along the way. I'd never gotten a C. And, and all of a sudden, I found my urge one day in a class of, man, if I don't perform here pretty quick, I might get a D. And all of a sudden, I said, a bell ring in my head. I said, wait a minute. And so, you know, there's a lot of ways to get educated in college. You find out a lot of things about yourself as well as your ability to learn. Right. Let me ask you um, a question. <coughs> your father, had he, he, for some reason, was really interested in engineering, but he knew of Purdue. He, yeah, my dad was, he, he was without, a, without a formal it. education, he yeah. was a very well-rounded individual. He knew a lot about a lot of things. And I, and I say he was one of, those, one of those people who could do anything mechanically. Sure. Electrically, mechanically, right. physically. He just had that knack to be able he, to do he it. Just, he was born with that. I, I don't know where it came from. But he, uh, I will tell you this, he, he always felt MIT might be the epitome of engineering schools. And I remember that. But it, it, MIT was, was out of our financial reach. It just, it was, you know, it was just an idea. Purdue was within reach, and when I worked on that Navy ROTC scholarship, it became a very viable alternative. And as far as he was concerned, Purdue, if not, was at least as good as MIT uh, in terms of engineering. Somehow, he didn't think Illinois, not, not, not a ramp on University of Illinois, but he just didn't think <laughs> El University of Illinois compared to Purdue and what it could offer young young people like me, or what, or the education that he wanted me to get. Right, and felt that Purdue yeah. met that need. Uh, a couple things on the on the astronaut on the selection process. I'm thinking of this for a researcher. Uh, um, do you apply, or how do you get into the astronaut program? Well, it's very strange. I uh, I was in a third. In a th we, let me go back a little bit. Historically, Sputnik flew in uh, fifty seven. 57. The first seven astronauts, John Glenn, Alan Shepard, and that group, were selected in 58, the Mercury astronauts. Then the second group, which included Neil Armstrong, second group of nine, were selected in 62, I think came to work to NASA in 63. I was in a group of 14, which was selected in 63, went to Houston in January 64. We ended up to be the nucleus of the Gemini and Apollo program. The Mercury astronauts flew the first Mercury series of spacecraft. When Alan Shepard flew in May of 1961, I had just come off of my second cruise off of aircraft carriers in the Western Pacific back into San Diego. And I remember watching Alan Shepard's flight, and I was going to get married the next day. And uh, my wife at the time said, uh, when we watched Alan go up, she said, well, how would you like to do that? Man, I'd love to do it. Man, just turn me loose. But I was sitting behind the defense of a television screen because I knew I was not qualified. I didn't have enough jet time at NASA required. I had not yet been in the Navy long enough to go to test pilot school. I'd, I've been in the Navy five years. That was my five-year ambition. Where do I go now? What do I do now? Do, do I go find a job? Do I go to work somewhere? Because what I was doing and they were paying me for it was not a job. It was just a challenge, exciting, uh, the best flying in the world. And uh, the Navy said, no, no, we don't want you to get out. I was about ready to get out. Navy said, we don't want you to get out. How about we, we'll send you to postgraduate school in Monterey, California, and uh, you can get a master's in uh, master's there. And, I, and so I said, just got married, Monterey, Carmel, 
you know, God's country and, uh, and I get an education and I could still fly because the Navy still had airplanes there, we could, we could fly. Not off of carriers, but we were flying. And uh, so I said, okay. And uh, it was a two year program to get a master's because they sort of overdid it. And I was working on my master's in aeronautical engineering. Uh, and, and I was gonna go for a third year and I was accepted to Princeton. And the Navy, you know, you never get something for nothing. You had to give them two years back for every year of, edu mm -hmm. of college they gave you. So now, with three years, I was committed to six more. So, you know, that gave me another nine years in the Navy. And that's sort of, well, I can look down the line. Maybe I'll stay in the Navy. And in, in between my second and third year, between the time I was finishing up uh, in the summer and the then planning to go to Princeton, I got a call from the Navy Department saying, now, now mind you, I didn't volunteer for the space program, saying, we want to recommend you to NASA for further evaluation. And I was startled and like a dummy, I said, for what? And this lieutenant commander that I was talking to sounded irritated. He said, for the Apollo program. And it blew me away. And uh, I said, well, not only yes, but hell yes. And he said, that's not good enough. This was a Friday. And he said, we got to know in writing by Monday morning at 9 o'clock. Typical. So I sent him a telegram. And then, and I was working during a summer internship at Aerojet General in, in Sacramento. Went back to Monterey. Told my wife, said, guess what I did? I just volunteered for the space program. They still had probably a, a thousand civilians on their list. And I don't know how many military, probably four or 500 military. And uh, so my, I didn't know what I was in for, didn't know what my chances were. And so that started several weeks, couple months of sending you reams of paper questions uh, essay responses, uh, never saw a soul, sent it back in, you know, and uh, then you get another letter back with another round of paperwork. So I guess I was still in, and all the time they were eliminating, slowly eliminating people. And then I got an invitation to go down to Houston, Texas. That's where the headquarters were, even in those days in Houston. Pardon? That was the headquarters was in Houston. Eventually, that's where the okay. space, Johnson okay. Space Center was. And uh, got an invitation to go to Houston, Texas, and went down to the old Rice Hotel, walked in the ballroom with 400, I'm not kidding, 400 of the most qualified aviators in the entire country. They'd broken every speed record, every altitude record. There were combat pilots there. Don't forget, this is 1963, uh, uh, and me. And I still, I was still there, and I don't forget, I hadn't had enough jet time, I hadn't been at test pilot school. And I thought, well, you know, now that I'm here, maybe I'll get a chance to meet an astronaut. And we went, we were there for a week. And we went through all kinds of, you know, uh, testing and questions and interviews. And, and uh, you know, they, they, they'd ask you questions about orbital mechanics, things I knew nothing about. And I think, in retrospect, they were trying to not really didn't care whether you knew the answers, but cared for how you approach the answer. And, uh, and so when you left after that, they said, don't call me, we'll call you. And my chances of getting in the space program at that time were slim to none, quite frankly. I did meet a couple of astronauts because they had a little, little uh, reception for us, and I met Wally Shira and and uh, Alan Shepard and a couple others. And that was a big deal. And uh, another couple of weeks or three weeks went by and I get an invitation to go down to San Antonio, Lackland Air Force Base to the hospital for a physical. When I went down there, I realized that that 400 of the can't miss guys, there was only 36 left. And and I thought, well, golly, maybe I really do have a chance. We didn't know whether they were going to pick two or 22. Had no idea. And uh, uh, we, uh, 
you know, I, I was still there. We lost, uh, they were looking at that point in time as reasons to not accept you. You know, they had 36 guys that thought were pretty well qualified. And they were looking for reasons to cut you out. We lost four guys in the physicals for very minor little things. Uh, and, and that left uh, 32 of us. And another couple of weeks went by and I got a phone call from a man who became my boss, one of the original seven, Deke Slayton, and he said, you want to, still want to come to work? I got a job for you. And so they chose 14 of us. Uh, and now I'm walking the halls with the likes of Alan Shepard and John Glenn and, and Neil Armstrong. Neil and I became office mates, shared an office together at that point in time. Neither one of us had flown. And uh, I had a chance to fly. I was to be, the competition was really keen, friendly but keen, keen competition. And out of the 14 of us, we, five of us flew in Gemini. And I was slated to be the fifth one to fly in Gemini. Not that, uh, not that I didn't feel there were more guys more qualified than me, but uh, uh, I was slated to be the fifth. Uh, I was backing up the crew of uh, Gemini 9. Uh, they had a horrible accident, killed themselves in St. Louis, crashed their airplane, and Tom Stafford and I became the prime crew of Gemini 9. So now I was the second of our group of 14 to fly. And when I flew in June of 1966, I became the youngest American ever to fly in space. Your Gagarin was younger, but I was the youngest American ever to fly in space. And that's when we were circling the Earth, did a lot of rendezvous for three days, and, and uh, walked in space when we knew nothing about what we were doing. And I, I call that uh, a chapter in my book, Space Walk from Hell, because only by the grace of God I'm here today to talk about it. It was very interesting, to say the least. I can imagine. Yeah. Very good. Um, and would you like to make any comments overall on the on the uh, flights that you were involved in? Any any comments you'd like to make on the and the on any of the flights, the key ones that you were on? Oh yeah, I could talk a lifetime about about uh, okay. all of them. Just a, about anything. all of them. Uh, you know, very quickly uh, uh, after Gemini Nine, I backed up Gemini Twelve, and then we were the backup crew for Apollo One. <clears throat> which is a crew that, that uh, we lost in a fire on a pad back in uh, 1967. Uh, then we backed up, eventually backed up uh, Apollo 7, which became the first mm -hmm. flight of the Apollo spacecraft. And then I had a chance to uh, <clears throat> fly Apollo 10 as a lunar module pilot spacecraft for Snoopy and Charlie Brown, and everybody remembers those names. And um, we were at one time were, were, were destined to be the first attempt at landing. And then a number of things happened that changed all that. So we took the lunar module, first lunar module ever to go, second lunar module to fly, first to go to the moon and went down to about 50,000 feet and did everything but land and left that final 50,000 feet. Duplicated Neil Armstrong's mission, which was going to be two months later, and except to 50,000 feet. And so we came close, but not quite close enough. And uh, subsequently, I backed up Alan Shepard, of all people, uh, the, the man who many years earlier was uh, simply an unknown hero to me. And here I was, was interesting about that. Uh, Ten years earlier, I was like everybody else, watching in amazement as he was the first American in space. And now I'm standing next to him as his equal because I was a backup commander. I had to be his equal. I had to be able to do everything on a flight that he had to do. And yet I stood there having flown twice, been to the moon, and he only had 16 minutes of space flight experience. I learned more from him about working on that flight and the evening before he left to the moon when we just sat there traditionally and looked at that big old, old rocket that was going to take him there. I learned more about the meaning of commitment from him that I ever thought possible. And so that was my other flight I never flew. And then 
was back up was was commander of Apollo 17. Ended up to be last man on the moon. We're there for 75 hours. Drove a lunar car around the moon, putting that all in one big box. I, I, you couldn't have written a script any better. I, you know, coming back here to Purdue with the orders in my hand to go to Navy flight plan, plan my dream, and someone would have told me that would have been happening. You, you could not have written a book, and that's why I look back and say, somehow I'm just the luckiest human being in the world. It just, it, I don't know how it worked out that way, and sometimes it almost seems like that happened in my other life. Yeah. Nicely said. That's good. Um, talk about family. Um, where did you where did you meet your wife at Purdue or? No, oh. my I met my wife in California. She was a uh, uh, airline a flight attendant. I guess we call them hostesses at that point in time. Right. For they continental, wore a hat and all for that a hat. little hat, little <laughs> red beanie, and a hat. Flew for Continental Airlines, okay. which was a young up and coming airline, and she was flying out of from California to uh, Chicago to Kansas City to Denver when Continental would just got the big 707s. They were just getting in it. Prior to that, she was flying the old prop jet Viscounts in New Mexico and so forth. And uh, I met her by accident, uh, and I was uh, in San Diego headed home for Christmas, going home commercially, went up to the airport in Los Angeles, and she was in her uniform, standing in line to get a ticket. She had a couple of days off to go see some friends somewhere. And uh, I, I just attracted my attention. I caught her name and wrote it down. And about three or four weeks later, came back off leave and tried to chase her down with Continental Airlines. And they would never give me her name. And I thought, I'd like to meet this lady. And so a friend, a lady, for wife of a friend of mine, was able to say she was a lost, lost sister, and they gave her the name, and I called her up one day, and I told her who I was, and which was nothing at the time, and uh, asked her for a date, and she took me up on it, and we ended up getting married at one daughter, and three lovely grandchildren by my daughter, and okay. um, unfortunately, that marriage lasted about, well, fortunately, it lasted 20, years, but unfortunately we became divorced. You know, I, I tell you, the good news and bad news about the space program is, it, you know, the good news speaks for itself. But we were gone seven, eight days a week. Uh, we were tunnel visioned. Uh, we were focused on the moon. Uh, we knew we were coming back, but our wives didn't. You know, I, it, and so we got so involved in what we were doing, we tended, all of us tended to, to some degree, take our families for granted. We'd be gone being in simulators all night long, somewhere on one coast or the other, come home and want a home cooked meal, and your wife's been taking the garbage out and, and you know, fixing your kid's skin knee and doing all the things mothers and wives have to do while you're gone. And and I put this in my book. I think we were very unfair to our families and very unfair to our wives. And you know, uh, in, in a case of one or two of the wives, they got tired of being Mrs. Astronaut. They wanted to be who they were. And um, you know, I think there's something like 60 percent of those first three groups of astronauts ended up being divorced. And and I'm not proud of that. Boy, and I just happened to be one of them, and I never thought that would happen in my life, mm -hmm. but it happened. And then, but she got married again, and I got married again, and and uh, my wife has two daughters, and between them, they got six. So I got nine great grandkids here. Okay. Another twenty years later into my life. Sounds good to me. Uh, let's talk. Just make a couple. Let's talk a little bit about giving back at Purdue. One of the things I think is cars nice is that you were in Cary Quad the first year, and they put a plaque. On the door, wasn't there something in the the Northwest Carry Quad, the Northwest plaque in December of nineteen? You were there in seventy two. They put some little mark on the door in the, in Carry Quad because you were there. You lived in there your first year. I did. I lived yeah. in Carry in, right. in Carry Hall, uh, my whole first year in in college. Right. 
You're telling me something I don't know. Well, they put I a plaque on the paper. door of the room I lived the, in? The, uh, Someone they lived in Cary Quad freshman year. Some kind of a ceremony took place in December of 72. I wasn't here for it. I, I guess I didn't. I didn't. I <laughs> never. You check just, my newspaper article and send you that. <laughs> you're telling me something I don't know. Well, well that's know. interesting. I maybe I'll go back Hopefully there and I, take a look. <laughs> and then, of course, you you got the honorary doctorate. Tell us I a little about that. That's uh, well, you know, I got, and that was special. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know that I deserved it. I don't know what the criteria for <laughs> getting an honorary doctorate at Purdue is. I outstanding alumni. I got a lot of awards here from Purdue. Uh, That's nice. This is, you know, and you're a DEA. You got a D, the Distinguished Engineering alumnus. Uh, a DEA Distinguished Engineering alumnus. So yeah, I did that. Mm -hmm. And as I say, I don't know whether I deserved any of those, uh, but it, quite an honor to to be. And you get, you know, because of what we did and the visibility we had the space program, uh, you receive a lot of those kinds of things. And I've got some doctor's degrees from a few other universities and colleges. Uh, maybe I've talked at a graduation or whatever. But to, when it comes from your own, okay, when it comes from your own, and Purdue is, quote, my own, those things have a lot more meaning. To, to get a distinguished alumni award, to get an honorary doctor degree or distinguished engineering, award from from where you grew up from quote your hometown oh. from Purdue is Purdue is my hometown during a really important years of my life that makes it special that yeah. makes it important very nice nicely said and and to see to receive a uh, the, the navy is the other big thing and and I was honored here a few years ago, oh, it's one thing to get a distinguished service cross, and one those are all important things. But I was honored with some pretty special people whose name you'd, rec you'd recognize in the in Pensacola in the in the in the Navy Museum Foundation Hall of Honor uh, with people like Halsey and Nimitz, and you go on and on in the naval aviation history, like Purdue. That is special. That's unique. Uh, to get a uh, uh, to, to to be in the Hall of Fame of some museum in far off Long Island is fine. And but it doesn't have the meaning these other you things know, have. Good point. Nice. It, it really doesn't. And the president's it, not council. That they, you got not that you're not appreciative, but. I know. It's much more personal. Honors and recognition from your own right. are so much more important. Right. And the President's Council with the Distinguished Service Award, you also received that. From the President's Council, Distinguished yeah, Service Award. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah, I, I don't I don't try and advertise all those awards well, too much. But, uh, the um, we want the Virginia Kelly Carnes Archives and Special Collections. You've given some your paper materials, which is really well. I'm in the nice. process. Neil and I—that's a real honor, right? <clears throat> that the university would like to and, archive and Neil Neil's and Neil my Hunt. papers, and that truly was a special honor when I was told about that. And uh, so we are uh, are proceeding to give them what some of the stuff that I call stuff and junk, and, and some of it's very sentimental and important. Some of it, I, I, you know. Quote, stuff has different labels. Some are significant artifacts you may have flown in space. Some are things that have to do with your period of life here at Purdue. Uh, some may be letters from presidents or people like Bob Hope, who I got to know very well over the years, where it's a personal letter which I think someday somebody, some young man or woman, would like to understand when I get a letter that's signed Ron and up here it says President of the United States and it's from Ronald Reagan. I'm proud of that, but I think Purdue ought to have those kind of things and that's what I'm doing. And what I sometimes, what I call stuff or junk, 
the folks here in the library at the archives said, wait a minute, don't throw it away. Send it to <laughs> us. Right. We'll worry about whether right. it's junk or yeah. not. <laughs> so I'm proud of that. Uh, that. That's something I'm extremely proud that they wanted to do. And I'm trying to work very closely. Um, and I think it's important because it's just happened in the last week that a good friend of mine, at, 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 at a request I made of him, uh, Baron Hilton and the Conrad Hilton Foundation just gave a two million dollar grant to the Purdue Libraries to endow an archivist to put together all of Neil Armstrong's and my quote stuff. I am so proud of that and and Baron has been a friend for a long time, and the whole world knows who Baron Hilton is. But for him to do that and think that much of Neil and myself, and and to think that much of what Purdue can do and will do with that information is is it's, it's special. Nice. It's special. Right. Um, the the in clo the um, what's the next best thing in the space program? As for example. Yeah, they discuss it in the media of the U.S. economy. Just a couple comments on What's that. What's the next? Best, best, next big thing in the space program. They're all talking about the next big thing in the economy the, these the, days. The, the, the next big thing in the space yeah. program, if it goes the way the president administration wants it to go, will be a mission to nowhere. Neil Armstrong, Jim Lovell, and I have been fighting this administration's proposal for space for over a year now. Uh, anything that seems to, and I don't want to sound too political, but anything that seems to exude American excellence, and space is certainly one of them. We've led the world for 50 years since the day JFK said we're gonna, we're gonna go to the moon and do the other things. And, and the present administration wants to dismantle that. And there's many of us who are determined not to let that happen. And fortunately, space has always, always been a bipartisan, mm -hmm. had bipartisan support for the last half century. Uh, I think there's wiser and smarter heads in Washington who won't allow that to happen. Now, the whole country is in a financial bind. So, but it's not money. It's, and the space program, unbelievably, a lot of people don't know, it takes less than one penny out of every one of our tax dollars. Just less than one penny. But I think there's wiser heads in Congress that are going to take the money we have and make sure it's directed properly right, to sure. keep America out in front. Now, what is going to happen? Uh, the good news is we have a a uh, a major space station, International Space Station, which is functioning well, which will be up there for another 10 or 15 years. The bad news after the last shuttle flights flies about the middle of this year, the United States of America will have given up any access to that space station. We will have no access. We will have no rocket, no capability for the next five or six or more years, depending upon the commitment we make here in the next six months to get to that space station. Yeah. The other piece of bad news is we will not have the capability for another generation to go back to the moon and or on to Mars. Uh, people can talk about it. But unless we make a commitment as a nation, unless we, we have a goal, unless we accept a challenge like we did back in 61, when Kennedy asked us to do what I think most people thought was impossible, we're never going to get there from here. And so one of the things we're fighting is to make sure that those generations who follow in our footsteps have an opportunity that we had and and you know I I maybe I'm the eternal optimist. I'm a realist, but I know that there's a young boy and a young girl out there with the um, with the desire and the will 
who will take us back out there where we belong. We, our generation, and, and a generation who follows us has to give them the opportunity to allow their dreams to come true. I dreamed about flying airplanes off of aircraft carriers. And when I was a kid, we couldn't afford to put me in, get me an airplane ride. I never was in an airplane, you know, until I was probably 20 years old. But I was, a, I, I was given the opportunity to make my dream come true. And little did I know that dream would allow me to call the moon my home. And so that's where we headed in space today. Right now it's indeterminable, but I can promise you that we're not gonna, we're, we're, this mission to nowhere that is, that is being planned by the President administration, which truly is, takes us nowhere, uh, is not in the cards. We are gonna, yeah. this country will remain the number one country in the world in space exploration and technology. Look how many astronauts have gone through this university does that say something for our capability? Yeah, the technology, point. what this university teaches, and the inspiration, and that's the key. We got to re-inspire kids to dream. And the, and the greatest legacy from the Wright brothers is not the fact that we can fly higher and faster and further than we've ever been able to fly before. It's the fact that they inspired all of us who followed in their footsteps. Okay. And I hope we can do the same to those who follow in our footsteps to dream and then go out and make their dreams come true. I tell kids, dream the impossible, then go make it happen. I went to the moon, tell me what you can't do. Right. And I think that's what the future is all about. It's very uncertain right now, but what we don't do, another nation will do. Right. China, Russia, India today will pick up where we left off and we'll be somewhere down in a mediocre world if we're not careful. Right. Did anything that I forgot to ask or anything that you'd like to say in closing? Oh, we could go on well, and answer the question, what's it like, what's two. it feel like? We could, we could <laughs> get into the philosophical aspects <laughs> of going to the moon. The, um, you know, we could, do, I mean, we could talk here for hours about those kind of things. We'll put that on the agenda. Pardon? For, we'll put that on a future agenda. Yeah, okay. and I think that's a that's a subject that I don't know. Uh, I talked to a couple of young men yesterday who I'm going to talk to a whole group of of young um, Fijis here tonight, uh -huh. undergraduates. And as a prelude, they saw uh, a couple of movies. One's was one was um, In the Shadow of the Moon, which is a documentary that came out, which just put you know, eight or ten of us in a chair like this over a period of time and let us talk about those kinds of things. Were you afraid you wouldn't get home? Were you scared? Did you feel any closer to God? What did the earth look like? Uh, what were you thinking when you stepped on the moon? How did you feel when you took that final step that you knew was going to be done? You know, when we just talked and, and, and talked about things today that we would never talk to each other about 30 and 40 years yeah. ago. We were too macho, you know. We did, we debriefed the flights, we said what we had to do, but we never let ourselves Understood. come out as, as individuals as to what we really felt and thought. And I think those kinds of things are worth talking about in the future yeah. because uh, those are the kind of things that, that uh, I think future generations need to know. If you had Neil Armstrong and Christopher Columbus sitting side by side here right now, I can almost promise you, you'd ask them the same questions. You wouldn't say how many, how many kilobits in a nanoseconds did it take you to go around the moon? And Mr. Columbus, how many square meters did you have in a mainsail as you went? You know, technology is long since been forgotten and overshadowed by time. What you'd ask them both is, gee, Mr. Columbus, gee, Mr. Armstrong, did you ever think you might not get home? Or, gee, Mr. Columbus, were you ever concerned about sailing off the edge of the earth? And Mr. Armstrong, were you ever concerned about uh, uh, hitting too hard on a moon? And, you know, it, you'd, you'd ask them the same philosophical, maybe even spiritual questions. 
And, and that's what people can relate to today. It, that, that hasn't changed, and I don't think it, it ever will change. We, we haven't changed. You know, we got the same heart, the same soul, the same mind. We, you know, we understand fear and, and enjoyment and all those things related to different things we've done in our life. And, and, and I can promise you that, that Columbus had the same feelings and thoughts as Neil did. You're right. Good point. And those are things I think worth talking about as we go into the future. Right. I agree with you. Gene Cern and I want to thank you very much for this wonderful interview and opportunity to conduct it for our oral history program. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure, pleasure. being here. <laughs>